everyone to our second virtual Donkey Creek Salmon Tour. I'm here at Austin Estuary, right behind the Gig Harbor History Museum with Skeena. <laughs> and we are going to be talking about uh, this creek and the restoration that was done here. Um, we're standing right at the edge of the estuary, kind of right exactly where the fresh water and the salt water mix together. So keep your eyes peeled for any wildlife that pops up in the background. We have seen a harbor seal swimming around looking for his breakfast. We've seen uh, a number of birds in the area as well. Although now that I say that, to <laughs> I'll be I'll I'll make Rachel do a lot of talking and then if I see anything cool I'll make sure to interrupt her and uh, point that out. Of course for those of you tuning in uh, let us know where you're watching from. We love to see how wide and far our videos are reaching and if you want even share it with your friends and get them watching too. So uh, yeah salmon tour part two. All right. What are we learning about today? The number one question I get well I guess there's two uh, top questions that we get on our salmon tours and the first one is why is it called Donkey Creek? Because you look around and you're like, I don't see any donkeys. What's with that? Um, and the reason it is called Donkey Creek has to do with the early logging industry here in the harbor. They utilized an engine called a donkey engine to do the work of hauling the logs. So I've got a photo here, so hopefully you can see this. This is that donkey engine, and you can see those are some really, really big logs that they are. Uh, hauling out into the estuary. They would be floated on rafts or milled right here at the Charles Osgood Austin uh, wood mill, which is kind of cool. So that's how the creek got its name. It has nothing to do with actual donkeys, which I think surprises a lot of people. Uh, Mary is letting us know that we can't really hear you, Rachel. Oh, you can't really hear me? We're trying out mics today. Let's ditch our mics. Okay, we're ditching our mics and I'll put my mask on and stand closer. Perfect. All right, we're trying some more. <laughs> I'm gonna Thank unplug you for some me things. Back. That is helpful. Okay. Do, right. do, do. Hopefully, you can hear us better now. I'll say that part about Donkey Creek again. Yeah. Why not? Cool. All right. Uh, take what, two. Number one question: What? Why is this creek called Donkey Creek? Where are the wild roaming donkeys? I see them nowhere. Oh. The oh, this. <laughs> name of Donkey Creek comes from the donkey engine that was used by the early loggers in this area to haul logs down into the estuary where they could be floated in big rafts and sold via the waterway or they were milled right here at the Charles Osgood Austin Mill. You may recognize that name Austin as the name of Austin Estuary. Now it's Ruby. also important for us to acknowledge that we are standing on the traditional lands of the Spoyalapop people you may know them as the Puyallup tribe of Indians, and we want to just take a moment and acknowledge them as the original stewards of this place. Now, that being said, this place looks a lot different than it has in the past, even our recent past. So let's talk a little bit. Let's walk along and see if we can get a little bit closer uh, to the creek. Again, um, I will say, in our very first tour, I walked up to this nice thing oh, yeah. um, and wanted to make sure we talk about this thing before we leave it, yeah, although there will be more along the way. This is the number, this is the second most frequent question I get is, <laughs> what are those weird, like, obelisk things? What are, what's with the cement pyramids or whatever you want to call these things? Um, and what this is, is the original trestle bridge, um, these are called the abutments, and they held up the bridge that crossed the creek um, prior to about uh, 1950 or so. So let's walk along and I can tell you a little bit about how the transformation of this creek went from being a free, flo free flowing creek to one that was kind of trapped in a culvert to becoming a restored and free flowing creek once again. So Perfect. And you'll definitely notice as we walk along, there are so many people out. It is a great time to come down and view salmon. It's, it's not even raining. It's beautiful. We um, don't get too many November <laughs> days like this. And yeah. I'm, I'm actually quite sad that we're not hosting the Chum Festival today. Today's the day that we normally would gather here and hundreds of people would come to champion and cheer those fish home on their journey. And we would eat Chum burgers and we'd give these salmon tours and have fish printing and all kinds of fun kind of activities. Um, here's a great place to kind of stop and peek at the creek because what we can see here is the bridge 
this is a uh, Harborview Drive that wraps and crosses the creek. So this place looked very, very different than it has in the past. So let me show you this photo here from 1950. So this is the path of the creek here. And this is a culvert, about a three foot wide culvert that was placed to route the creek underground. And a bulldozer just plowed it all under. And that was so that they could put a road across and widen the trestle bridge that was there. So that original bridge was taken down and those abutments that we saw were just kind of used as filler uh, to fill in that area. And then the new road went on top. So if we look into our more recent past, this area underwent a transformation, a restoration that the city of Gig Harbor took on that was completed in 2013. And here's a little bit of how it used to look. Here's that road that went straight across the creek, the creek running through a culvert right here. And that was excavated and removed. That's when those abutments were discovered and the city thought that would make kind of a cool feature to pop up around the park. And I know that there's some signage being um, planned to explain what those are to all the curious yeah. passersby. I kind of want to step back a little bit more because you can see we have the old schoolhouse here, which is right behind us. So if we yeah, yeah. just kind of scooch back, <laughs> get a really good... <laughs> this is this. Isn't that crazy how close the creek is and how far the road is? So that road over there is still in place. So that kind of hopefully gives you a picture of what it is that we're, we're kind of looking at here. Um, here's a little closer image of, this is the whole area that has become the daylighted creek. And we say it's daylighted because now for the first time in over, gosh, 60 years, the creek has access to the daylight and those fish have a really um, much more easy path swimming up. So let's go underneath uh, the new bridge and we can talk a little bit about the salmon life cycle and why this restoration was so critical to the health of the fish that live here. You can see this is a really nice beautiful bridge. It's got um, you know some piping underneath it and I like to reference that larger pipe. That's almost the same size as the one that salmon would have been swimming through. Now you can look at the volume of water that we have here and see that this amount of water would never fit in a pipe that size unless the flow was really just gushing. Um, and that is probably the main barrier that the salmon <laughs> on this creek had. Welcome home, salmon. Swim through this fire hose, please. Exactly. That's a really, really great uh, way to compare it because <laughs> it really is a huge barrier for them. So let's, um, let's look at our, our creek and see if we we may see a salmon or two wander by, or if we're really lucky, we may see a salmon predator or two. We have spotted harbor seals swimming up this length of creek on a high tide like this. We've got about a 12 foot high right now, and it's just now cresting down, which is the perfect time for salmon viewing. Wow. I at least see a salmon carcass. Ooh, that's a good sign. That kind of, going to awkwardly point to it. Merp, <laughs> over there. <laughs> Here, we can uh, do kind of a fun trick when it comes to viewing our fish. Sina and I utilize polarized sunglasses, so that kind of cuts down on the amount of glare. So, Sina, pop your lens over that, and maybe we can see even easier into the creek. The sun's making it fairly visible. Yeah. <laughs> I see our shadows. Hi! Hi! <laughs> All right, let's talk salmon life cycle a little bit. So uh, salmon have a really incredible life cycle. They begin as eggs that are laid in freshwater streams. And for this species, the chum salmon, they're gonna be laid in uh, this time of year. So late November is perfect for them. The little eggs are gonna stay in the gravel of the stream until about January when they'll hatch. Once they hatch out of their little eggs, they're going to go head down and swim to try to stay anchored in that sediment. They don't want to be um, free flowing in the creek because they'll just get washed right out. 
Think of how much rain and water we have landing in our watershed and flowing and filling our creek. They're really swollen in those January months. So our little babies, they head down. Around March or April, depending on the temperature and the flow of the water, they're going to head up to the surface. They're going to grab a mouthful of air. That's going to inflate their swim bladder and give them sort of the gas that they need to be able to be neutrally buoyant in the water. Then they're going to make their way slowly out the creek. And they usually kind of group together in numbers, so you could come here around tax day and see little kind of handfuls of baby fish migrating out. They're going to acclimate right here. This is the place where fresh water and salt water mix together. And we can tell that because the water volume of the stream changes with the tides at this location. So we know we have salt water influx. On a low tide, you can also see evidence of barnacles that are forming on these rocks. Well, barnacles can only live in salt water. So we know that salt water comes up this high. And the mixing of fresh water and salt water together in the estuary is what allows salmon to undergo this remarkable transformation called smoltification. Now, when we do this with kids, we always have them act it out because they, we learn with our bodies, right? When you're younger. And so we always like to say, all right, we're going to go smoltification. And they go from being a freshwater fish to a saltwater fish. And from then on, their entire lives are spent in the salt water, getting big, getting fat, until a little alarm bell goes off in their brain and says, it's time to head home. And so the salmon, remarkably, from as far away in the Pacific Ocean as Japan, are going to turn around. They're going to swim back. They're going to pass by, hopefully, all the um, people fishing for them and trying to capture them when they're nice and big and fat <laughs> and delicious. And they're going to make their way to their home stream. Now, they navigate a couple of different ways. They can use the um, magnetic field of the Earth. They kind of imprint it upon that and have this road map in their brain. They can also use their nose. And salmon noses are not like our noses. Our nose connects to our mouth, so you can breathe through your nose or your mouth. Salmon don't breathe through their nose. It's just a little cup that's filled with some, uh, some nerves. So sometimes you'll see salmon that will, eat, when they're out in the estuary, in like the bays and harbors, they'll launch up into the air and kind of jump. <laughs> and scientists for a long time were puzzled by why this happened. Were they trying to avoid predators? Is there something chasing them? Because that's a really common fish behavior. Were they uh, trying to loosen up the eggs inside of them? because that might be an issue too. They're kind of almost uh, stuck together in their mesenteries and they need to be free flowing. So maybe it's that. But then some scientists um, decided to plug salmon's noses and see how they navigated home. And it turns out the ones with plugged noses end up in the wrong stream about half the time. And so it's theorized that those nasal pits when they jump out of the water and jump back in, it kind of clears out what water is sitting inside those little noses. So yeah, it's kind of cool. Jumping for joy and jumping for a good new yeah. whiff of water. Jumping to get a good sniff of your <laughs> So those salmon are going to come back to the stream where they hatched, and then they're going to make their way up. Now this stream is a very short stream. It originates about where the roundabouts are, and if you've ever walked the Cushman Trail and you've walked over the wetland, that's the origin of the water for this. So the surrounding watershed is going to feed into that wetland. The wetland then feeds the creek. So Donkey Creek does flow all year round, which is really important for salmon. If you have a small enough stream where it dries up in the summer, it's really unlikely that it's going to be able to sustain the fish. So our salmon are going to head up. The female salmon, she will be the one who selects the location for the eggs. So she will take her tail and kind of flap it on the ground, digs out a little depression called a red, and then she's going to wait there until the right male comes along. So she's going to be kind of choosy and picky, looking for uh, the strongest, the biggest, the most colorful, the best hooked nose, and the biggest teeth salmon. That's what the lady fish find attractive. And once one comes along, she'll signal him that she's going to drop her egg. He'll um, immediately fertilize them. And then the two fish are kind of their death. She might spawn at a couple of different reds. Um, but once her eggs are gone, once the male is empty of all of his sperm, they will die and their carcasses will wash out. Now, come walk with me this way. We saw a couple of carcasses of these 
I'm gonna do a quick pause because I was noticing we have our lovely signage here. So again, some more restoration peaks of the bulldozer before daylighting, after daylighting. And as we walk, you'll see the current kind of look at Donkey Creek. So, but yes, salmon carcasses. Okay, here's one right here. Dun, 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 dun. This is where you may want, uh, to, you know, pop some sunglasses over that and see if you can see that a little better. Um, so these, these carcasses are a really helpful uh, sort of boost of nutrients and fertilizer for all of the native plants here that are gonna shade the creek and help protect the salmon. Now, when we had this big culvert, amazingly, a few fish were able to make it up. And the um, Fisherman's Club of Gig Harbor also operated a remote site incubator on this uh, location that helped to kind of bolster and boost the salmon population. But we'll talk about that more in part three next Saturday. You'll have to tune in again. <laughs> um, but uh, what that fire hose that Stina mentioned earlier really meant that the carcasses weren't gonna be enriching the upland area. They kind of got kicked back out into, uh, into the bay and the harbor and they didn't have that fertilizing effect. So not only is this a restoration that benefits the fish, this is also a restoration that benefits all of the surrounding foliage, all of the riparian zone that is kind of growing in. Now these are all new plants. Uh, in that image Stina showed you a moment ago, this was all bare hillside with no plants whatsoever. Um, and native plants were planted, but of course we always get a few uh, invasive species that, that kind of take over in any disturbed area, like this Himalayan blackberry. Himalayan blackberry. Dun, dun, dun. Then we have little volunteers like this. This is a big leaf maple, and though the leaves are pretty small right now, this is a species that can be gigantic. Um, and it can <laughs> well, tower move, over little maple. This, this entire creek and provide really much needed shade and cover for these fish. So even though it's delighted now, there's still a lot of things that we would love to see to make this a more natural stream. Things like logs, big boulders, anything that kind of changes the flow and creates little pockets where the fish can rest would really benefit these fish. Now we do see that as we go farther up the stream, there are some uh, trees that have fallen down, there are some logs down in the creek, and all of that helps to uh, give our little salmon a place to rest because even though their journey is a short one here in the creek, they have traveled from very far, thousands of miles away in the Pacific Ocean. Awesome. Do we want to walk up a little bit and see if we yeah, can- Yeah, let's see if we can see some. See some fish? Why not? We're here. We got a nice, <laughs> yeah. nice high tide. Um, oftentimes, if you're looking for the best time to view salmon, you're going to have the most luck right after a high tide. So as the tide starts to recede, um, that fresh water that's been kind of pushed up by the salt water is going to be released and that can be a signal to the fish waiting out there in the bay that it's time to move up. Yeah, and before we leave, yeah. quick plug for our yeah, salmon observation station. Complete with hand sanitizer. Um, but we can look and see what we're seeing. So there are some live fish being observed. Yeah, just yesterday. Perfect. I love it. Oh, five live. Great. Five, 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 four. Yeah, so people are seeing fish. This is great. And a lot of these are happening. Notice the early morning, 7 a.m. And in the afternoon, looking at all kinds of stuff. Oh, somebody lost their Dodge car key. If somebody sees it. Uh, call this number. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. Super cool. Uh, and this is a, a, a really great project that helps us to be able to know when the fish come back and what kind of conditions they need so that we can plan events and videos and things like that to show you these cool things. Yeah, and I wanted to point out, uh, just in the spirit of reduce, reuse, recycle, this is an old Costco wine box um, <laughs> that has been transformed. And yeah, you see the, the label, yes, uh, definitely. So uh, just a fun little detail there. So stop by Donkey Creek, add some observations to our community science efforts here to understand great times to view salmon. Okay. Marching along. Oh, I see a few little 
Oh, oh yeah. Yes. These are probably really hard to can, see. With that the one's good to see, kind of. It's got a little reflection, <laughs> but you can <laughs> see that carcass is pinned under a log. And then this one, definitely a little tricky with the reflection there, but you can get that Justice, good fish shape. Fish <laughs> awesome. Oftentimes we get we get calls being, you know, the local environmental organization that people will call us and say like, hey, there's a bunch of dead fish. What are you guys gonna go do about it? You gonna go clean those up? Um, and our answer is always, no, they're important for the whole of the environment. Oh, I see a live one too. Oh, and I'm moving up. Let's head to the platform and get a, maybe a better view. Actually, let's look at these ducks really quick. Yeah, let me, I was just, you can see these, this little pair of fish just moseying up the creek here. And then Rachel did mention our lovely Yeah, so these, uh, we've got some mallard ducks and it looks like maybe some rowans with that white chest on there. That's a domesticated mallard and oftentimes domesticated animals tend to get those white splotches, right? Think of your cat with their white paws and chest or cows with their white blotches. Kind of cool to see, but these, um, these ducks, we see them every year. They take advantage of the eggs that are being laid. So they'll head upstream when it's a little more shallow and they'll kick their little ducky feet and try to dislodge <laughs> some eggs for breakfast. Nothing like a salmon omelet. Mm. Oh, <laughs> um, but this, this is a good spot to view. Um, because we finally get some tree cover. So with the branches that go over the creek and sort of the, the shrub and you know smaller understory plants, that gives salmon a bit of confidence. So it's unlikely that the fish are gonna stop in that open area where the big restoration has taken place. They're more likely to hang out um, and rest here where they're not so vulnerable to predators. <laughs> I'm just, you're talking about resting and, and I have just... this little dead salmon that looks very uh, cozy. Very rested. <laughs> Rested. Sorry, everybody. Uh, <laughs> it's a little too perfect. Okay. <laughs> uh, again, if, for those of you who are tuning in, if you want to leave in the comments where you're watching from, um, we love to know. I see Austin out there. I'm guessing we got some uh, Pennsylvania. Is that where you're at? <laughs> That's exciting. Oh, fish yes. right here. Um, so, you know, let's try again with the polarized lenses, I think. Okay. If you, you're gonna have to hold it probably. Okay. Um, but now you can see into the water a little bit. We've got a pair of male and female right here to the right. I wonder, can you zoom in while I, uh, yeah. Pinch. There we go. So you can see the female with the dark bar on her side in the front. She'll be the one that uh, kind of creates the nest and then following behind her is a courting male. He's got kind of purple splotchy sides on him. Um, they also tend to be a little bit bigger. Cool to see. Now this is not a great spawning location because we do have saltwater influx all the way up past uh, the remote site incubator but uh not too much farther from here for them to travel so we should we should start seeing lots of courting behavior but i don't think she would dig a red right here or at least i hope she wouldn't because this is not not a good spot eggs would not survive here that's why if you tuned in for part one of our salmon tour we were right under the bridge and you we saw some salmon doing kind of that courting mm -hmm. shimmy Little look dance at this dance. one over here yeah uh, <laughs> And I was like, not here, guys. <laughs> this is a it. terrible spot for you. Yeah, they know. Um, um, here's the salmon, actually two salmon that yeah. have that kind of zombie look to them. They're uh, got that white fungus. Fresh water definitely starts deteriorating their skin. So you'll see kind of that white coloration as they're rotting. Yeah. Their, their <laughs> immune systems no longer, you know, they're not really into the self-preservation side of things. So a lot of... Uh, diseases and fungus and some, things like that kind of take over and they start looking really rough there? a uh, yeah. but they're they're still able to reproduce and lay their eggs and get them fertilized so they'll they'll make it hopefully 
always coming to say hi to you. <laughs> hi, fishy. Hey, yeah. oh, I love so, it. So yeah, we, we encourage you, if you can come out um, to view the salmon, this is a really great spot. We've got this wonderful platform where you can look at them from above. I definitely mm -hmm. recommend uh, polarized glasses if you can because oh, yeah, can't hear you. <laughs> um, get polarized glasses if you can because the glare is pretty intense even um, on a cloudy day um, and you'll be able to see much more fish activity but I recommend you know on the the waning high tide is a great time to view so check your tide tables and come on out this week and see what you can see fill out that salmon observation station. I love to see lots of data there. Yeah. And then check back next week. Uh, we'll be out here doing another salmon tour. Yeah, and we'll, we'll be talk more about these mysterious barrels across the way and uh, reviewing that salmon life cycle. We'll probably uh, make Rachel do the full dance. Uh, we kind of did the smultification wiggle earlier, but uh, we'll do the full like egg to adult to tree and i'll probably <laughs> i'll probably grab a carcass for us to get a nice up close view all right of these fish yeah something we do a lot with kids is we look at the macro invertebrates in the stream mm. but right now because the salmon are laying their reds those salmon nests it's not ideal for us to go tromping through the creek looking for bugs so you get to wait till <laughs> spring for those kind of <laughs> tours this is a great location because this is a newly fallen log. This um, red alder tree has fallen into the creek and is created over. this wonderful little resting pool. So the salmon, they may have to uh, jump a little bit, but you can see there's fish on the, on the left side, on the upstream side of this. Um, so they can make it. Might be fun. It would be fun to see this one like hop over it. How you gonna do it, buddy? <laughs> He'll probably wait till the water level drops and then he's like, oh no, I gotta go now or never. It's probably hard to know that like, okay, if I jump over this thing, is there actually water on the other side? <laughs> like, yeah. get the periscope out. Interesting. Yeah, it's just, what a treat to come out here on a nice November day and watch some salmon completing their incredible life cycle here. Um, and we're just so excited that we get to bring that salmon magic your way. Oh yeah, just like Rachel said, there's fish on the other fish side. On the other side. Hanging in there. Oh, so cool. So incredible. All right, well, I think, is there anything else for our Donkey Creek virtual tour number two? Uh, learn have fun. <laughs> learn have fun. Uh, of course, if you enjoyed this content, I guess definitely feel free to share it. Share it with your yes, people. You. Um, comment, like, all that stuff. Those are easy, fun, free ways for you to support Harbor Wild Watch during these kind of weird wild times. Um, and of course, if you want to make a donation, that's available on this link as well as our website. Um, and you can even become a Steward Club member. Uh, Rachel and I just filmed a Steward Club only video yesterday. So we'll be featuring that in the Steward Club's monthly little email there. Uh, other fun emails to get involved with are the weekly wild side and that I'm hearing a lot of ruckus up here. <laughs> uh, but that is a fun email that uh, is a weekly thing. It has a creature feature, a stewardship tip, and all of our upcoming events for the week. And so uh, despite the pandemic, we're out and about bringing you fun, free digital content, and we hope you are enjoying it. So with that, thanks for tuning in to our second part of our virtual Donkey Creek tours here today. And uh, we appreciate all of you for tuning in and learning and having fun with us. So with that, Happy salmon weather!